Hello, it's Blockchain Brad, and today a special update from Bobby Ong. He is the COO of CoinGecko, or CG, and once again he's here to provide all the updates, but more importantly we're going to talk about the hot topic of late, and that is the Binance acquisition of CMC, or CoinMarketCap. So Bobby, thank you very much, mate, for being here to give us an update and an inside scoop on your thoughts on what's been happening lately. Pleasure, always happy to be on the show. Likewise, mate. Now, as I said before, you know, you are the COO of CG or CoinGecko. Much respect, firstly. And the reason is that you are now officially the world's number one independent analytics site or data aggregator. So congratulations on that title. And we, we're going to dig into the reasons why that is true. But how's everything going? You know, how's more generally the, the CoinGecko team um, moving in this tough time? Yeah, I mean, things have been pretty dramatic in March. Uh, we saw Bitcoin price going down 50% on, on, on Thursday, uh, Black Thursday, we call it. Uh, but otherwise, uh, things are okay. We're all long-term hodlers. It doesn't really matter the price movement on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the coronavirus has uh, definitely thrown things into the spanner. Um, everyone's uh, working from home now. Uh, it's all purely remote at this point in time. Uh, but we're still growing. We, have, we just onboarded someone during this... Uh, um, while we're all working from home and, and we're all going forward as usual. Mm. Well, much respect, you know, for the way that you manage this difficult situation. Obviously, you have to decentralise the team you know, right down to location, um, but clearly you've led this out well as the COO, so kudos to all of you. Now, as I mentioned before, there's been a lot happening with regard to acquisitions of other um, like data aggregating sites. And, you know, I'm sure you can see the, the inference there, and that is the coin market cap uh, situation where Binance has acquired that now. I wanted to ask you what your thoughts are on that, just, just as a starting comment, knowing that it has happened and it has already been announced. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the blog announced that uh, Binance acquired coin market cap for 400 million US dollars. Uh, we don't know if that's the actual amount because the official statement said that uh, the amount is actually undisclosed, but if it's actually $400 million or anywhere close to that amount, it's actually a big win for the industry because now we're seeing a lot of major, major, major mergers and acquisitions, uh, major M&A ha activity happening in the industry, which shows the maturity in the space. And it shows the strategic importance placed by the players in the industry in regards to the data space that CoinMarketCap and CoinGecko in inhabits. Uh, this is a good thing because this $400 million price tag, if it's true, it's actually the largest m a acquisition in the crypto space after the circus acquisition of Poloniex. So uh, I view that generally as positive. It's quite interesting with regards to the, the price tag um, because I was having a call with a potential investor and, and while, while, while we're having a call and she was asking me what were some of the valuation metrics that CoinGecko is looking at and then right as we were having this conversation, the news broke. And I say, hey, there you have it. We now have a comparable uh, to, to compare. At this point in time is to look at the neutrality and independence of coin market cap after this Binance uh, acquisition. Will coin market cap still remaining uh, still remain independent and neutral after that? It's going to be hard, I would say, for for this to happen because um, obviously uh, Binance having paid four hundred million dollars has a strong incentive to get their money back from coin market cap. And, and we shall see how, how things play out. Uh, CoinGecko at this point in time after this acquisition is now the largest independent market data aggregator. We have been bootstrapped since day one and we haven't really, we haven't taken any investments from anyone. So we are truly the only player that can call, that can say that we are neutral in the space. Mm. So um, a lot of people in the industry has said that uh, CoinMarketCap will no longer be independent and transparent. Although CZ or Binance has clearly said and also the coin market cap uh, team has said that they will remain independent so i think it's interesting to see how things play out in the next few months and and we are definitely here to fill the fill the role and to continue growing uh showing independent neutral transparent data wherever we can for mm. to help grow the crypto community and bobby it's a really mature response i think given that you could really go for the throat, so to speak, given that you are the COO of arguably competitor to CMC. So it's interesting to hear, first and foremost, you do value that independent position that you have at CoinGecko. Now, just more generally, what do you think is the true value of independence in this situation, given that, you know, 
right across the board in crypto, we value removing ourselves from Finance 101, removing ourselves from that centralised sort of uh, system that has been always hierarchical and difficult to penetrate when it comes to access. Now, clearly, being an independent actor here is a beneficial, but what are your thoughts on the imperative of a data aggregator being independent? Is it something that is an, a necessity, something that needs to continue? Yeah, uh, most definitely. I think it's very important to to have a party that is uh, independent. Even while we have not been acquired by anyone, uh, we don't have investors from anyone, uh, we show data and uh, we receive uh, numerous uh, requests from exchanges from coins to sort of um, get their numbers appearing better on CoinGecko. And then we have to evaluate each of their requests and see whether it makes sense or doesn't make sense. Some of them have uh, valid points, but sometimes it just doesn't make any sense uh, because all of them have their own inherent interest to, to make themselves look better on, on, on an on aggregator like, like us. So, yeah, I think it's very important to, to try to stay neutral. Um, but I can, I, I can imagine the internal struggles of the team is going to be tough whenever, for example, if some, if what's going to happen if, if CoinMarketCap team thinks that Binance is no longer uh, has the most liquid exchange in the world, like, Whereas Binance says they have the most liquid exchange, so who is going to make the final call, like to show the most uh, the, the liquidity of Binance on 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 coin market cap after that? So uh, that's something that, that that will be very hard to see. I think for now it's all okay because Binance is still the largest, uh, most liquid exchange in the world. But uh, who knows? Uh, one year, two years from now on, well, we shall see. I mean, I, I still hope that's the case because Binance has been doing a tremendous job in, in growing the crypto space so far. Mm. But uh, we have seen from historical, uh, from history that, that that's not always a case. Like if you think about the king of altcoin exchanges from uh, 2013, 2014 up to now, like it used to be like exchanges like Wikurex and then it went on to Cripsy, MinPal, Poloniex, uh, Bittrex and now Binance. So it's been like the throne has been pretty much been changing. And I think Binance has held the throne for the longest period of time. So kudos on them. I think CZ uh, is doing really a lot of things to try to keep on to that to the throne of being the largest, most liquid exchange. And I think he's been doing that, uh, doing uh, a way better job than any of the previous, uh, previous exchanges. So let's see how things go. Absolutely. And it's interesting to see this move. Obviously, it's a move to try and maintain their pole position. Um, and, all, and one of the key points that uh, has been thrown around is that um, the coin market cap itself has some of the most significant traffic, if not the most traffic for any crypto sort of startup and data aggregator. And we will talk about that. But I wanted to pull it back for a moment to you. You mentioned um, in the suggestions about the value, you know, the stated value or the um, the estimate, estimated value through the block of this acquisition and how it could actually facilitate parties like you in terms of determining your own value. Have you given any thought to your own value when it comes to um, a monetary side of things, given that there is that um, suggestion out there, that number thrown around between 300 and 400 million for that acquisition? We don't know, of course, but has it really started to make you think as COO, what is the value of a CG? Yeah, it's something that we ask ourselves uh, between my co-founder and I, what's the value of CG and how much do we value ourselves? Uh, we never raise any money from any external investors, so there is no valuation price tag on a company per se. Um, but if we do want to raise, then what's the price tag that we want to go? Um, as I mentioned earlier, it was interesting that the investor asked us the question as the news broke. Um, so generally, uh, I guess it's a measure. It's a function of three things, right? One is a function of how much revenue or pro and profit that you make as a company. The second thing is how much uh, reach that you have as a company. And the third thing is, um, uh, what are there any comparable valuations which now CoinMarketCap has provided for us? So, so based on these three things, we can probably some sort of come up with a valuation based on how big CoinGecko is relative to CoinMarketCap, and then come up with a, a comparable uh, valuation, I suppose. I see. Well, the good news that clearly there is value there. We know that from this acquisition. Now, have you ever considered or has the team ever considered in discussions um, the prospect of, of allowing yourselves to be acquired by another party like Coinbase, for example? Is it something that is possible in the future? Um, we, we, it's something that we are starting to ask ourselves more seriously if it makes sense to even uh, consider 
having an exchange as an investor or eventually, uh, eventually selling company to an exchange because we have seen quite clearly now, like whenever ag aggregator sells out to an exchange, uh, there's, some, there's all sort of uh, uh, controversy that comes out questioning mm -hmm. the independence of it. So it's something that we have to think hard about for ourselves if that's the route that we want to go. Uh, but we have no plans or intention to sell the company at this point in time. Uh, we are in it for the long haul. We have been in the space since 2014. It's been six years now. Uh, there's no real reason for us to raise money or to, to, to sell the company at this point in time. So it's just, let's see how this uh, grow. Uh, we believe the industry is just way as infancy at this point in time. Uh, we believe that the industry will grow 10x, twin, uh, 100x in the future and, and we just want to ride on this wave and see how things go. Because uh, our vision has always been the case in this case that if you think of a world where anything and everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized, we are nowhere near that vision. So I believe in the, in the next 10 years, 20 years, it will be very interesting to see how things go. So um, we want to try to stay independent as much as we can and for as long as we can and, and, and let's see how it goes because you have no plans to sell at this point in time. Well, that's good news and it's music to the ears of those who want to see the, uh, these data aggregators maintain their independence. You are number one in the world for doing that. Um, but I want to now talk a little bit about some of the things that CZ has said, he obviously as the, the leader of Binance. Now, referring to this acquisition, he said that it, he, he referenced the size of, of the acquisition. It was a sub substantial one. You've also mentioned compared to others, it is the, arguably one of the most substantial. Um, but he also discussed how he's known the CEO of CMC for some time. So there was always this interest in acquiring it from what he said. Um, and he'd also mentioned that he too, like you've mentioned, has a long-term vision for crypto itself, you know, suggesting there's a long roadmap ahead and he's even referenced things like 10X and beyond. So in that sense, you both are very much uh, in the frame of mind of seeing significant value for the future of crypto. But one of the things that was clear is that he also saw that coin market cap had the best traffic of any site arguably in the space. Now, obviously you do your analytics and you would certainly know that given that you know, you're a competitor. But given that it has such a significant um, effect when it comes to traffic, are you concerned at all that a lot of that traffic is now going to be uh, transferred over to Binance? whereby they leverage that purchase and you know, allow Binance to have that market share by, by sheer connection, regardless of the independent situation that they're suggesting they'll have. Yeah, so I think CoinMarketCap has one of, uh, is the most uh, valuable web property on the internet, uh, in the crypto space. At least, uh, they do, uh, we, we at CoinGecko do about 15 million monthly page views and based on our internal is they have about uh, five to six times more traffic than us. Uh, this gap we have tried, uh, we've been trying to close for the past year and a half. I've been quite successful in closing the gap, but there's still a large gap between us and CoinMarketCap. And, we, and, and uh, kudos to the CoinMarketCap team because they have done a tremendous job in terms of SEO. So uh, every, any, almost everyone in the industry refers to CoinMarketCap when it comes to uh, crypto price. And that's something that uh, Binance clearly see value in. And it's something that uh, I saw an interview from CZ and it's basically the main uh, factor for him to acquire CoinMarketCap because it's a top of the funnel approach uh, to capture future users for Binance. So at, at this point in time, uh, CoinMarketCap could be doing 50, uh, 70, 100 million page views per month. Um, when the bull market comes back, uh, they will be doing 10x uh, traffic from there. And, and, and Binance hopes to capture a large portion of this traffic and move them onto, onto Binance to, to, for them to trade there. Uh, if you think about it, the business model of a data aggregator is uh, not as uh, uh, lucrative as compared to that of an exchange. Uh, CoinMarketCap at this point in time makes money from uh, advertising and from the API sales where, uh, and if you look at the average revenue per user, uh, it's significantly lower than what Binance is making from their trading platform on their spot, margin, futures, uh, staking, and more. Um, mm. So, so Binance clearly has a lot of incentive to funnel, funnel, funnel users from from coin market cap. And I think the price tag. We think about price tag like four hundred million might be a large sum to pay today, especially during a bear market. But if you think of crypto going ten x, like four hundred million uh, in the future, will will be chump change for for CZ because he can make that money back uh, from all these new users that will come on to. Um, 
onto onto Binance. But more importantly as well, I think another big point for, for CZ is that if he doesn't acquire coin market cap and if they are uh, certain to sell, like if it goes into the hand of uh, some other competitors, for example, Coinbase or mm. KuCoin or Huobi or who any, who anyone else, right? It just poses a big threat to them in the future. So this is a defensive move to some extent. Now that they've locked up coin market cap, like no one else can, that your competitors can't have access to. It's sort of a bit similar to Facebook buying up Instagram and Facebook buying up WhatsApp so that Google or Amazon or someone else can't have these social media communication companies to build on, uh, build on a platform to challenge them. So, yeah, I think for us at CoinGecko, uh, it's a huge gap. We have all these things that we have planned and, and we need to, to grow and execute. Uh, I'm really proud of my team. If you think about it, like we have uh, only 13 team members in CoinGecko. Uh, and we've been pretty much uh, perform, uh, building up a lot of features uh, in the past year and a half uh, with a significantly uh, smaller team size. So... Uh, we just have to continue growing, growing the team and improving up more features to, to sort of compete in, um, in the space. Absolutely. And it is, you've clearly been growing and that's what's been interesting for many people following your progress. And also obviously CMC has grown, you know, over time, not a huge team either. And even CZ has conceded that. But what are the thing, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because who better to ask than the CEO of a competitor, is that there's been some suggestions that with this acquisition, they may even change the CMC um, revenue model, whereby they may switch into a subscription model. I mean, it, a lot of things are obviously on the boardroom table right now, but they also want to expand it significantly to include futures and options and a great deal of, of tools, you know, opening up a significant suite to expand the, the, the offerings of CMC. So are you concerned at all about any of that when it's, arguably going to have a direct effect on Binance. I, I think Binance will do what is best for the, them and the industry in general. Um, but I think, I think CoinMarketCap uh, adding more features is uh, given now that they have more resources under Binance. They've started uh, adding a derivative section recently, uh, pretty much follow what we did, uh, which we launched like half a year earlier on CoinGecko. We started tracking the perpetual swap and the futures market. Um, they, 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 it's just a matter of time before everyone needs to start tracking options. Binance is launching options sometime in Q2. CZ has already sneak peek some of the screenshots from the options. Uh, mm -hmm. But we can also see Derby and FTX also having uh, an options market. So I think, I think if you think about the crypto data space, there'll be a lot more data coming up in the space and, and, and it's just a matter of time for aggregators to track everything in the space, I would say. Right, okay. Now, I just want to touch on some quotes as well as we move through the interview um, from different sources. One that you had mentioned before uh, from CoinMarketCap. Now, they've said, um, we are in firm agreement with Binance um, that we will not interfere with any of the relationship that we have with, with CMC. Um, businesses will be independent. So what, what's happening right now is there's a lot of affirmations, a lot of statements going on in this space from all kinds of parties, but particularly from Binance and CMC, stating they will guarantee this independent stance despite um, the acquisition that took place. But interestingly, Binance tweeted back and said, welcome to the family, CMC. So I wanted to sort of pose those two um, tweets because whilst they're clear on the independence, they're also suggesting there's a family sentiment. So, you know, Again, I, I'm not trying to suggest anything beyond that, but it does seem like there's a lot of inclusivity and cross-collaboration. Yeah, um, I think that's there's, there's expected and, to, and, and given the sense that if you paid 400 million for something that's part of a family now and, and at some point you want to see some sort of closer collaboration and, and, and um, to see how, how, how the child can help the parent company at some point, uh, we don't know yet. Everything's still very early at this point in time. So it's just a matter of just wait and see. Um, I think uh, CoinMarketCap uh, and Binance, they have no choice but to go out uh, and strong to say that they will maintain independence in the sense that when the block 
Hong Kong broke the news two days, uh, two or three days before the official announcement came out. Uh, I was surprised on Twitter in the sense that everyone was pretty much against the acquisition and then call out uh, that there will be huge conflict of interest and there's no longer neutral independence. I don't know if it's because people are jealous about Binance and CZ being too big and, and if you think about Binance taking over the world, you can bet it's because people are, are jealous of CZ and Binance being too sad and we got taxed so long ago, neutral independent and the people have to start using an independent source like us. So um, I think Binance and, and, and CMC had no choice but to make an, a strong statement that then transparent to sort of uh, beat this threat, I would say. Right, okay. Now, one of the things I also found interesting is in the feedback and the discussions that have been happening since the announcement, one of the things Binance has explained, or CZ rather, is that when there was some discussion or questions about modes of payment with regard to the acquisition, he made the point that BNB is cash, you know, cash to him, cash to them, as in the Binance team. And there was also some suggestions from the block that BNB was part of the payment. Um, of the acquisition itself, which we don't really know, as you know. But what are your thoughts on this idea of BNB being cash, you know, an equivalent to cash? Are you there, yeah, I actually agree with CZ on that in the sense that if, do you consider Bitcoin as cash? I, I do in a sense because uh, Bitcoin is a, yeah, uh, yes. So I actually CZ on this, the large uh, cap crypto A and I want to sell it to fiat or USDT, I can do it instantly to a, to a certain amount. Of course, if I'm looking to move like 500 million US, uh, Bitcoin in, move of Bitcoin into USDT or US dollar, that's going to be tough because there will be some sort of a slippage, a large slippage at that sense. But otherwise, to me, it's, 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 it's cash, like it's fairly liquid. You can move it into any currencies that you want. And it's the same for BT or to USD directly or to Bitcoin. And, and, and then, then you can spend the money however we want. Uh, to me, that's cash. Um, right. I think what the, term, what the term of the deal doesn't say is that, especially from the blog, is that we don't know if the BNB that, or that, that is given to the, to the founder is locked or not. So uh, probably there is a combination of equity and, and, and cash, which could be in BTC, USDT, right. or BNB. And, and there's probably some sort of... Uh, uh, announced structure and the tokens may be locked up to one year, two years, three years, depending on, on certain performance from the company, I suppose. That, that's, right. that's probably my guess. I, I have no idea what things are, but just an just a estimate or a guess. I see. And for all the listeners as well, I want to you know, thank you for continuing through in this interview despite some of the technical issues we're having. It's purely because of our situation where, we, where Bobby's had to switch into a mobile um, service so that we can have this interview. Now, I wanted to ask you, Bobby, about um, the essentially the situation of Bitwise. Now, as you know, through the SEC work that they've you know, been collaborating on, they've always said that there's a huge problem with the majority of the volume that's reported in crypto. Now, when we consider CMC and we consider target data aggregation, we've talked about this before, are you concerned that this will not improve with the acquisition or will it improve, do you think, um, with regard to transparency of real data, of accurate reporting, of um, accurate volumes? Because even today, we still hear feedback from CEOs, actually, that there's still problems with CMC's reporting. Yeah, it's actually a very, very tough problem to solve. Um, I think at this point in time, we reach a stage where uh, reported trading volume from regulated, large regulated exchanges can only uh, can be trusted. Uh, if it's uh, not a large exchange, uh, then it's highly likely that they are sort of faking their volume. So I wouldn't use any of the volume that's reported by many of these guys actually uh, and, and, and if you want to stack these exchanges up and compare them against each other and see who has a, a, a more legit volume uh, that then, then uh, it comes to a situation where we at CoinGecko believe that, that volume is no longer a good indicator and we have to look at several different metrics beyond volume so one of the things that we believe that uh, can be done is we come up with an algorithm called a trust score where uh, besides looking at trading volume, we 
which is a smaller percentage of what it would be was stage. We look at their order book data to look up at the 2% range. We look at the bid-ask spread. We look at the estimated uh, traffic, uh, as how much web traffic that they are doing. Because if we believe that an exchange that has large legit volume, we most likely have more, more web traffic on their site. We look at uh, um, the API quality and a bunch of other metrics. If we put together and come up with a trust, uh, we have a score, which is a number from 1 to 10, uh, determining which exchange has the most legit volume. So if we go to coingecko.com slash exchange, you see that uh, most exchanges uh, on the top of the list, for example, on Earth, it's actually uh, things like exchanges like Binance, Coinbase, uh, Bitfinex, uh, and so on. So these are the kind of exchanges which we will expect to see, not some sort of a small um, Chinese agent-based exchanges which we've never heard of before. Uh, mm -hmm. being at the top of the list. Right, you make a good point there. And just with the way you've done your trust score, I wanted to ask you, do you genuinely see a correlation between your data and CMC's data? Uh, again, referencing Bitwise, they've made the point that, uh, and they've actually referenced CoinMarketCap you know, in their concerns with regard to um, providing questionable data because you know, they argue that up to 95% of real vo of volumes out there is fake. So in that sense, do you find distinctions and differences between you and CMC or do you tend to see more correlations? Yeah, so on CoinMarketCap, there's three different ways of looking at exchanges. One is by reported volume, which is no longer a good indicator because Binance is, which is the most liquid exchange at this point in time, is ranked number 16 or, or so. Uh, and then the second way of looking at their ranking is by adjusted volume, which is basically a solution which they came up to beat uh, the trans fee mining exchanges. Uh, which is no longer the case these days, so that 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 ranking is sort of obsolete in my point of view. And the third way which they launched recently is by liquidity, which is essentially quite similar to what we do at CoinGecko using Trust Score. And uh, they rank hit BTC as number one, which I find uh, quite weird in the sense that hit BTC is not known as the actual core, but it has a lot of controversies behind them. And, and unfortunately, mm -hmm. CoinMarketCap ranks here as number one. I, I, I expect uh, CoinMarketCap to come out with some sort of a ranking improvement at some point because Binance was ranked number 16. And then after this, um, I don't know how they're going to do it, but um, probably Binance will start uh, showing better on their list after this. After this. Right, and that answers part of the question. question. That answers part of, I think, many people's question about whether or not things will change based on the acquisition, you know, especially given that you said they're ranked 16th now. I think, I think many are in agreement with you that things will change. Um, they wouldn't have spent that money if they didn't want to also perhaps you know, see better outcomes for Binance and their wider investment portfolio. But, you know, that's a big call. We have to see that. Um, what about things like lawsuits? Um, risks from the SEC. We see now that even CZ is embroiled in lawsuits um, from from reports, at least. Um, are you concerned at all about um, the legalities of what's what's happening with CMC? You know, are they completely legit from your understanding? Given that there's the reports of fake volume reporting and being an aggregator of that, are there any risks at all there? Yeah, I think there's definitely risk, but I think everyone's trying to do things to the best of their ability because um, this industry is full of, uh, I mean, the volumes that, that, that is shown on CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap to a large extent is obtained from an exchange's API. So if an exchange is reporting fake volume through their API and, and we display those data, like who is at fault then, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but we, we, at least from our side, we, we, we can't stand looking at exchanges with uh, fake volume uh, appearing at the top, so we put together an algorithm. So uh, at the very least, we exchange which we believe in our best ability has the best volume shows up at the top instead of someone outright completely scamming, uh, uh, mm. putting a fake volume out there. So um, I think it's a tough situation. Uh, this industry is not regulated. Um, if and when, um, at some point in the future, when things get regulated and all exchanges are regulated, then once you're regulated, it's impossible for you to do all these kind of dodgy things because the regulators will never allow such things to happen. So once things get more regulated, uh, the volume, and the data that the exchanges pass out can be trusted and can be used uh, for fair analysis. I think we are sort of uh, sitting in like in a in a middle ground at this point in time, where some exchanges are regulated by now and some are no longer regulated, and we're sitting in this uh, gray area of trying to move around the world mm. without uh, regulations. 
Uh, but this was a big improvement from what it was a few years ago where none of the exchanges were regulated and, and there was no legit place to trade crypto except well, there was no legit way. Uh, now some, some are regulated. Maybe in the future, I expect the number to grow up more. Uh, so there'll be more and more uh, regulated exchanges. Uh, I expect exchanges to get bigger and bigger. Uh, there'll be M&As as uh, exchanges acquire each other to get licenses. Uh, and then we probably start resembling the traditional market where some of the large exchanges uh, hold control of several of these uh, large exchanges. For example, like NASDAQ having a uh, hold of a few different ex- exchanges in the world and same for the London Stock Exchange and so, and so on. That's going to be exciting to see that evolve. And I can only imagine the value of your company by that stage, you know, considering that you're holding off, you know, and maintaining your independence. If things do play out and those mainstream actors do start to really acquire some of these key stakeholders in crypto, it's going to be a very different ball game. Now, with regard to what's happened, and also given that you know, in our past talks, you've always been supportive of Binance, and still to this day in this in, in this discussion, there's a lot of positive sentiment I'm hearing. Has it has the relationship between Binance and CoinGecko soured in any way with the acquisition, or is everything still? you know, as hunky-dory and everything going okay. Yeah, we hope Binance will still maintain a positive relationship and good relationship with us because we certainly want to maintain a good positive relationship with Binance. There is no point picking up fights in the industry. The industry is way too small. What we really want to do is present a united front and, and go out and convert the rest of the people who are not into crypto yet and get them into crypto because that's the real win. So, uh, yeah, that's my point of view. I think uh, I've got nothing against Binance. Uh, mm. Um, yeah, I just hope that they'll be neutral and fair and, and treat other aggregators uh, alike, even though they have one under their arms. Absolutely, and I hope that also out of fairness. Now, with regard to trust, now, that's not really something that a lot of people talk about in trustless sort of context when it comes to the tech. But when we're talking about that human aspect, one of the things that is true of CMC is that the CEO was never really in the public eye. He was always in that stealth mode. You, what are your thoughts on that? Why would a CEO be so difficult to con- connect with? Why would Brandon do that? I, I think he's a very private person. He wants to maintain his uh, privacy. Um, I think only in crypto is such a thing allowed. Uh, any other industry, you can't have an anonymous C. Anonymity and privacy is tolerated. And I think he's done a great job of maintaining his privacy up to now and, and selling his company. So... Uh, for a large sum so and it's actually a good thing like imagine you sell a company for 400 million uh, payable in crypto or in equity like probably going to be targeted by a lot of people because they know you have a lot of money so uh, I think he's got a big win in the sense that nobody knows who he is and he still maintains his relative privacy after this sale Right, that's a good response. I mean, the other option is having the CZ effect where I'm sure everyone's very much aware of who he is and the kind of wealth that he does now have. Um, with regard to the comparisons, we go back to that for a moment with CG and CMC. What, a, what are some of the shortcomings that you foresee either now or in the future with CMC with regard to um, you know, any foreseen, uh, foreseeable problems in what they what they stand for, what they are. You know, just love to hear your feedback. Given that you would no doubt evaluate them comprehensively, given they are a competitor. Not to share uh, too much. I mean, I guess it's just the wait and see approach. Everyone is in the crypto sphere is talking about how they are no longer new trend dependent. Uh, that's a conflict of interest. So I think all eyes will be on those those things and seeing how they perform on that on that regard. Mm. That regard. Got it. Now, one of the things that did come up a few days after we saw these announcements, after that first wave of uh, reactions, let's just say, and much of it was negative, we then saw the onflow of positive responses. So people like Ryan Selkis from Masari, Kyle Samani, and also Michael Arrington, they were some of the key people sort of in the, the hedge fund space um, or in the uh, you know, competitive space who were very supportive of the acquisition. So Kyle, for example, wrote, Binance is going to clean up CMC. And um, he said they will monetize asymmetrically and it's a win-win for the industry. And we heard that the sentiment sort of echo throughout, you know, those kinds of parties, as I mentioned. 
But I wanted to ask you, why do you think that is? Why would someone, for example, like Masari's Ryan um, Selkis, go out and um, advocate for you know this being uh, a good thing and it's a win-win and you know it's something that's good for the industry? Yeah, I think uh, any M and A in the industry is a good thing because it shows maturity in the space. Um, especially a large M and A shows it, it is uh, headline grabbing. Uh, opens up a lot of eyes uh, from people who may not be observing the industry closely. Uh, it's definitely good for Masari as well. Now there's a comparable valuation and it helps him in his fundraising round, subsequent fundraising round because he can go around like telling investors now that. Uh, look, we can. This is our vision. This is where we are, and and that if we do it well, this is our eventual exit plan. So um, yeah, I think I think I think the the is good for data companies like Masari and others in the sense that we now have comparable valuation. Um, in terms of the for the others, uh, um, let's see. I think definitely uh, Binance is going to clean up CMC. So so uh, we we'll see how things go. And we'll tell Bobby to see what happens. Now, one of the other parties and one of the media entities, um, Coin Telegraph, they had a very hyped view. Um, and obviously, we don't know which articles are paid and which aren't, which is one of the problems with a lot of these media entities. But they made the very audacious claim that the crypto community approves of this acquisition, you know, given their feedback. And it was interesting that the responses on Twitter to that article were predominantly the opposite. So we don't really know. But what are your thoughts on these kinds of articles that come through, like the Tele Coin Telegraph one, where they're just overtly promoting, you know, certain things? And we don't know in this case, but generally we do see that trend. Yeah, I guess for the Coin Telegraph article, I found it weird as well because it was overtly positive. So I guess it depends on who you ask. And it depends on the, their point of view, right? So some people may have a positive point of view of the acquisition. Some people may have a negative point of view. So uh yeah um in terms of coin telegraph um yeah i think they just need to be transparent if there's a paid article or not and and mm. and but at the end of the day coin telegraph is still the largest crypto media site they are bigger than coin they're bigger than the blog uh i think what they are good at is they produce a lot of articles and a lot of crypto newbies read coin telegraph and they take coin telegraph as a very strong a very good source of truth to uh for, for crypto reporting, but uh, anyone in the space will know that um, we need to read deeper and to know the real truth uh, beyond any articles. Can't just read anything that is written at face value, I would say, in crypto. Yeah, exactly, mate. And hopefully, just like you know, uh, Kyle's alleging that uh, Binance will clean up CMC, hopefully more of this media issue at a macro level in crypto will be cleaned up too because we just don't know sometimes. Now, with regard to some of the other responses, um, I've seen in the space. Um, I even saw you, Coin Gecko. You know your Twitter account retweet things like uh, "time to test Coin Gecko at first time after CMC gone in wrong hands," and that wasn't written by Coin Gecko, but it was retweeted. So I thought it was really interesting because someone in the in the uh, sort of the, who's managing the Twitter account has obviously felt that at the time when this happened, that there needed to be something said. So it was interesting that. There were, you were bold enough as a community, as a, as, a, as a team, to tweet out something of that sentiment. Yeah, I think uh, we share a lot of the sentiments of the community. At the end of the day, uh, crypto is about the community. If you don't have the community, then, then there's nothing that you can build. And uh, um, that, 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 that goes for any of the coin. And we have seen it firsthand, like Steemit and uh, Justin Sun, Justin tried to buy the Steam uh, community, but kind of ruining it or another community has gone on to build the Hive blockchain. Uh, the core members have moved on, but the, the, there's still a lot of people in Steam. And I think at the end of the day, it's the same thing in crypto. It's the same for anything in the crypto industry. Uh, can you maintain an engaged community uh, and engaged audience? If you can't, then that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can, then you live on and survive to the next day. Right. Well, it's interesting because Coindesk, they put out a title that said Binance just bought the top of the funnel, which I thought was sort of counter to the Cointelegraph sort of inference. So that was an interesting and bold title. But then Crypto Briefing went one step further and raised an important question I wanted to pose to you. You know, they made the point um, of asking, does crypto community even care about quality data or accurate data? Because their findings were that 
there was just so much overwhelming support over the, you know, over the week, you know, over the time since the announcement. And the question is, are people still hooked on hype um, and hooked on price and hooked on their own need to shield their own bags? I guess it depends on who you ask, right? If you ask a sophisticated at once, uh, institutional sort of person whether crypto data is important, of course, it's going to say, yes, it's very important because garbage in, garbage out. But if you talk to a, a regular Joe who doesn't really trade crypto full-time, who doesn't work in crypto full-time, he has a job uh, in a bar somewhere, and he has maybe some Bitcoin, some XRP, you know, like, is crypto important? Like, he probably only checks his, uh, the price once a day or once a few days and see how much money he has to spend on, on, on his rent, for example. So, um, yeah, for most people, um, it's not super important, but for the professionals, it's very important. Mm, that's a good point. Now, I've, I've grilled, you know, that topic and I do thank you sincerely for being so open and willing to answer all those comments re regarding that acquisition of CMC with Binance. But I wanted to now move across to you with CG or CoinGecko and ask about some of those developments that obviously you love talking about. We want to start with DeFi. How is CoinGecko innovating as DeFi continues to strengthen the narratives of value in crypto? Yeah, we see strong potential in DeFi. Uh, we've been seeing this trend for the past six, nine months, uh, one year in, in the space. Uh, at the start, it was relatively hard for us to understand and get into the space because things moved so quickly and there was, wasn't much resources in the space. But in the past few months, we got a hang of things and then we tried out almost every single DeFi application in the space. And what we realized was that this is very interesting and there's a lot of potential and benefits for the average Joe to get involved in DeFi. But the learning curve is just so incredibly hard. Uh, what we decided to do was that we wrote a book on DeFi. It's a book called How to DeFi, which is a 200 plus page book on the decentralized finance space. And, and it has over 26,000 words. And what it does is that it basically breaks down the decentralized finance space into simple, uh, sim in, in plain, simple English and talks about the various parts of DeFi, such as decentralized exchanges, decentralized derivatives, decentralized lottery, uh, and so on. And then we went one step deeper and we took an example from each category and provided a step-by-step -step guide of how to use this app. Because one of the main challenges for us, like even though we were in the crypto space and, and I heard of this DeFi thing for like the past one year, like it was very challenging for me to get hold and get used, uh, use any of these things. Like for example, like I don't even know how to open a CDP before this. Like, although I've read about it, I've read a white paper multiple times. Uh, but now through the book, like anyone can pick up the book, read it, and then there's step-by-step -step guide with screenshots of how to open a CDP, borrow money from Maker, or how to lend money on Compound and get an interest that is higher than your fixed deposit in the bank. So we've done all these things in the space. And, and I think uh, this DeFi space is growing really strongly as well. And one of the things that we've launched recently as well, we've come out with the earn section on CoinGecko, coingecko.com slash earn, where we started comparing the interest rates offered by these lending and borrowing platforms uh, to see who has the highest interest rates for your BTC, ETH, and uh, USDT, USDC uh, deposits. So where can you get the highest interest rates from all these platforms? And this includes the centralized and decentralized platforms. So we include platforms like Compound, DYDX, and also from platforms like uh, Binance uh -huh. and, and so on. Mm, that's interesting because it's almost like uh, now we see the opportunities in finance to rival those of the traditional and mainstream, whereby, you know, maybe in a few years time, we'll be wondering what on earth you know, that particular industry in the past was because everyone will hopefully have made the switch because it is so lucrative. Does it surprise you at all just how much interest you can actually get from making the switch into crypto-based lending? Yeah, I think, I think at this point in time, the space is still really early. Uh, it's still really hard to use all these depths. So uh, it's probably going to take a couple more years or uh, longer than that before things get more mainstream. But I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic that these apps will get more friendly, easier to use, and then things will improve. So uh, that's, that's the bet that you want to take on. Like, if you think about crypto like five years ago, like, it was so small. This industry is tiny. There was only Bitcoin and maybe like 20 other coins in the space, but now there's over 7,000 coins in the industry. Uh, no doubt many of them are, are not exactly 
uh, the most useful coin. But but I mean, it's a lot of it's very interesting. Like, and some of them have their own strong uh, use cases in the space at this point in time already. Yeah, it's really exciting. And as long as we can sift through the crypto crap and the the shit coins that do exist out there, there's definitely a growing number of those that have real utility or starting to prove through real adoption in time. Now, if we pull it back to some of the things you've been doing, you mentioned the trust score, which was really a great development. Are there any other key new features you've built in that you wanted to discuss in terms of your platform and, and the suite of services that you offer? Yeah, so I think I mentioned briefly, we launched a book recently, we launched earn section recently, and then one of the things that we also did last year was the derivative section. So we started tracking uh, futures and perpetual swap on CoinGecko. We're seeing a lot of uh, crypto exchanges uh, spot exchanges launching uh, their derivative platform. So I think the biggest move was Binance launching Binance Futures. Everybody saw how much money BitMEX is making in the space and wanted a share of the pie. So they all started launching their, 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 their derivative space. Everyone started offering 100x leverage and started going more than that 101, 105 and all. Um, I, I have reservations about super high levels. It just encourages people to get back, to be irresponsible and then lose all their money. Uh, but but people in the industry who I spoke to us uh, said that, hey, we can always compare it with the Forex industry where people trade 300, 400 to be irresponsible, but especially because Forex is more stable and, and crypto is more, more, more volatile. Mm. It's almost uh, like chalk uh, and cheese, the volatility. Uh, yeah, is so those, those are some of the main... Uh, features that we launched recently. Well, that's really exciting. And it's, it's great that you have included the derivatives. Now, obviously, I share your same view with regard to the 100 plus, you know, X margin trading or leverage trading sort of provisions because, you know, it is starting, there is a question of whether or not we have sound liquidity to cope with that yet, um, as you've suggested. But in time, hopefully people will start to acknowledge, you know, what is safe degrees of leverage. We have seen CZ react to that. So I wanted to ask you about that. What, what are your thoughts on his sudden reaction to FTX, for example, and FTT, and more importantly, those bear and bull tokens that were apparently going to do so well on Binance and were making Binance money? He pulled them all. Yeah, so to be honest, I'm surprised that those leverage tokens got listed on Binance in the first place because those are really sophisticated tokens that not many people could really understand how it works. Mm. And they're meant for short-term trading. In, uh, it's meant for you to have 3x. It's not, the way structure is not similar to just buying a contract and having 3x leverage because it, the, the contract rebalances itself uh, up every, every now and then. So if you hold those tokens for a long time, uh, with high volatility, especially when price moves up really fast and then moves down really fast, then then you get like the token value goes down over time. So I think that's that's one of the main reasons why uh, why Binance decided to pull off those leverage tokens because people were holding on to those token and then even though the price was moving up, but because of the volatility, it keeps rebalancing itself and and the value goes down over time. Yeah, and and it's really hard to explain that to an average guy why it's not similar to just buying a contract three X. Uh, compared to the leverage token, so uh, they pull yeah. it off, I suppose. You, you, that's a really good answer, I think. And also, there's the issue of decay, which is another complex issue that's built into the nature of those tokens. So perhaps it was prudent of him to pull them simply because you know the majority just didn't understand it wasn't a case of a flat three x by nature. Now, um, just finally, I wanted to ask you with regard to all yeah, the developments. They shouldn't have been listed in the first place. Right, okay. Well, at least you made that clear point. And I'm sure that there's a lot of people who agree with you as well on that point, Bobby. And, and hopefully now, you know, it, um, those that are listed, the things, the products that are listed are clear in nature so that there's no question of what they actually do you know, for, that, for the, the party that's um, purchased that, that particular token or that particular asset. Now, with regard to... Asia, I wanted to just touch on whether or not you thought, what your thoughts are on the prominence of Asia. Because you're based in Malaysia, because we've seen Binance just be such a, a force in crypto, do you think that Asia still rules crypto in the sense that they have the primary uh, position, they have the upper hand and they have the largest stake 
Yeah, if you look at the mining and trading space, they definitely Asia still rules the space. Uh, Asians love uh, mining and tr- uh, m- uh, mining and trading. Uh, I think if you look at the Bitcoin hash rate, like majority of mining miners mining pools are based in China. I think definitely more than fifty percent of miners are based in China. The hash rate is more than that in China. Uh, mm-hmm. In terms of trading, a lot of exchanges are from China. A lot of trading comes from the Chinese side. Uh, so that's that's probably one of the those two big things. But if you look at the technology and uh, decentralization part, like uh, I think I think Asia and uh, compared to the Americans and the Europeans, like uh, not pushing out uh, as much of an innovation uh, in terms of new new things in the space. Uh, I had a question the other day, like uh, asked to me, like who are the what do you think of the DeFi ecosystem in Asia? And I, I had a really hard time trying to think of. Uh, Asian team, Asian-based teams building on DeFi in the space. There are not that many. They, I can only think of three of my head: uh, Kyber, uh, the Ren team, and what's the third one? I can't remember. Uh, we've right got, now, but mm, we've got Nervo, Nervos, um, Terra. Uh, there's, a, there's a few. Yeah, but those, 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 those aren't really DeFi or Ethereum by per se, right? Mm. So whereas a lot of most of the DeFi, uh, DeFi teams are, are based in Europe. Uh, I believe, or America, you need to Well, yeah. let, let's talk about that. Let's open that up because a lot of people, when they hear the word DeFi, they do tend to gravitate to Ethereum. I wanted to ask you, why do you think that is? Because if we're really honest, isn't it fair to say that even Ethereum and Bitcoin are part of the DeFi narrative, especially given that you know, Bitcoin's premise was to, to decentralize, you know, to provide decentralized money or, or gold, whichever camp you're in. But do you see what I mean? Is that is it fair for us to say that all DeFi is Ethereum? I don't think so. I think we need to broaden it out. Yeah, you got a fair point. Um, DeFi is a broad term to represent any financial services offered on top of any blockchain that is decentralized in nature. So easiest way to think of an exchange instead of a centralized exchange like Binance, Coinbase, Kraken, you have a decentralized exchange. Uh, the reason why most of the people in the space associate DeFi with Ethereum is because Ethereum is the largest smart contract platform. It has the biggest community, has the biggest developer network. And uh, every of these DeFi applications are all mostly built on Ethereum. Mm. Uh, if I were to ask you, can you name a, De- a decentralized exchange built on top of EOS? You probably find it hard, whereas I can name like five, ten off my hand straight away. Uniswap, uh, Kyber and so on built on right. Ethereum. It's the same for lending protocol. Uh, Compound is built on top of Ethereum, but that doesn't stop them from building on top of EOS or uh, or any other smart contract platforms. Uh, it's just they, they, the teams realize that Ethereum has the largest mind share and they decided to build on Ethereum at this point in time. And they can always uh, build on top of Tron or any of the smart contract platform when they feel the time is right. And 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 we have starts. And, and we start seeing like some of these smart contract platforms doing similar things. So like uh, Justin Sun recently launched uh, his own MakerDAO equivalent on the Tron blockchain. He wants to get into DeFi. He wants to, to get onto the DeFi narrative and to keep Tron mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, uh, in mind for people talking about DeFi. So yeah, that, that's mainly Ethereum is the biggest network. It has the largest developer and everyone wants to build, to tap onto the largest community. But that doesn't mean that other, other, other smart contract platforms can't do it. They can mm. get into the DeFi space anytime. Uh, I think you raise such an important point and there does seem to be a lot of sort of uh, emphasis on the West when it comes to Ethereum's development. And certainly, as you said, they are leading the way in the de- DeFi narrative, rightly so, with all the developers that continue to innovate and iterate on the, the code and the network. Um, it's interesting, interesting to see that Binance is also jumping on board with Binance Chain and DeFi as well in the future. They're going to arguably be a player there. We see Cosmos, we see Icon, we see... Uh, you know, there's Aeon, we see many different parties trying to innovate in that space. But certainly, like you said, Ethereum is looking really good. And in particularly today, we saw significant market moves in the space, green across the board. What do you think is going on there? Why is it that Ethereum has just suddenly had a major upswing? Like in terms of the price movement today? Yeah. I mean, especially considering the market more generally, it's had a really significant upward move. And there seems to be a, a very positive sentiment more generally about Ethereum. Yeah, it's hard to say about the price movement. Uh, uh, I guess to a large extent, it's quite correlated with the S&P 500 these days. And then the S&P had a huge rally yesterday because uh, Wall Street thinks that 
coronavirus is reaching its peak, especially in Europe. So we probably seen the worst. Uh, so shares started going up, and then maybe Bitcoin uh, traders started thinking the same, and and, and going up as uh, Bitcoin Ethereum started going up as well. Ethereum, as we know, is uh, largely correlated with Bitcoin price uh, with higher volatility. So that's probably the reason why. It's hard to say on a short term basis, but mm. I think crypto prices have been going up uh, ever since. Uh, it dropped fifty percent uh, in mid March. When that you drop terrible Black, Black Thursday, Thursday. <laughs> we were yeah. trying to forget. Yeah, when it dropped all the way to three thousand eight hundred dollars for Bitcoin, like it was a good entry point. Ethereum was priced below hundred dollars. It was mm. ninety dollars or so at some point, and then it was a good entry price for anybody who had the guts to buy at any of those price because it was like a war zone at that point in time. I remember. Mm. And so, what about you, Bobby? Did you have the guts to jump in at that point? Yeah, I bought some. I, I've got my long-term holdings, which I don't touch and just keep on holding on for, for, for as long as I can. Like those, yeah, mate, I, I, I'm the same as you. I didn't quite make it into the 90s, but I certainly did my best to buy more at a lower mm. point. I think I entered in at 120, something like that. But I mean, I'm glad we're talking so openly about this because it's clear that Ethereum is one of those key leaders when it comes to these innovations with DeFi leading the way. And um, obviously, we want to right across the board and no doubt with your aggregation service with the data it lends itself perfectly to viable narratives because if things aren't real over time what's the point of having you know the world's best and most independent data aggregation service so it's really looking like a, a very long-term uh, position for you as a CEO you're not going anywhere I imagine nor is CG when it comes to an important role you play. So mate, I wanted to say thank you for your time today to be able to represent CoinGecko. Is there anything you wanted to add finally before we finish the today? Yeah, uh, I just want to say to everyone, like stay safe from this coronavirus, uh, stay at home. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, we just realized that the uh, most important thing is your health. Uh, yeah, and take this time while you're at home to learn, I suppose. Absolutely, mate. And thank you again for your time, especially given you know, the situation going on at the moment. And also, you, you made time today despite the technical issues and ha you having to use your mobile. So, mate, thanks again. And hopefully we can catch up again sometime in the future just to get those key updates as you continue, continue to build, as you continue to strengthen what is the world's most independent data aggregation and analytics site, CoinGecko.